All right, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining me. My name is Diana. I'm one of the principal advisors here at the Student Services. Um, today's workshop, like I said, a really practical workshop full of good information that you can take away. Um, for some of you, this might be new information. For some of you, you might already know this. And like I always say, take the golden nuggets with you, take the bits that are interesting, grab the bits that you want to and leave the rest. Some of the information will be appealing to some of you, some of it won't. There'll be aspects of it that you'll really like, aspects of it that you'll go, oh, I already know this. Um, I will do my best to keep my eye on the chat or the questions if you have anything, um, but I will leave a little bit of time at the end for us to go through some specific questions. All right, let's get started. So first of all, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians on the lands of where we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to the country. We recognize their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. So today, like I said, a very practical workshop. By the end of this workshop, you will have your own personal student budget. So you'll know what a budget is, how to use it, how to update it. You'll understand the different types of expenses that exist. Um, so that will be a little bit of the theory behind it. Um, for some of you who are new to Brisbane and new to Australia, um, we'll, under, we'll have a little bit of a chat on the cost of living in Australia, what that looks like, what you can expect. Um, by the end of it, you will have a better idea of your priorities and that will naturally come through the creation of the budget and your goals. And generally, you should get a greater insight into budgeting tips and money wasters. Um, as I mentioned before, make sure that you have something that you can write with, have an Excel spreadsheet open, a OneNote, a piece of paper, because I'm going to give you some practical things to do. I tend to find with these kind of workshops, we never have enough time. So some of the information will feel rushed. That's okay, because once we're done, I want you to continue working on the things that you started doing. So... Essentially, what is a budget and how do I use one? This is kind of the basic question that most of you want to answer when you come here. It depends on how you look at it, and there's a lot of psychology behind budgeting. But essentially, it's a plan for spending money. I know most of us think, oh, no, a budget is restrictive. A budget doesn't let me do anything. But actually, budgets should be liberating. You should feel nice and relaxed about your money, where it's going, how you're paying your bills, because you'll have a good budget. For some people, they like to look at budgets as a way to not spend money, um, but that kind of restrictive mindset often leads to people not wanting to engage in budgeting or feeling like budgeting is a bit of a chore or something too hard to do. The way I see budgeting, particularly as a student, it just helps to ensure that you are going to be able to live within your means and you're going to be able to reach your financial goals. Um, budgeting is a skill that has to be taught. It's not something that we're innately born with. It's not something that we know of straight away. Either we get taught this by our parents and our family, or we don't. Um, a lot of parents don't sit down with their kids and work out a budget and how much money comes in and how much money goes out until they're about to maybe move out of home and they're, they're paying for their own expenses. And even then, sometimes they don't sit down and write things clearly and carefully for them. So there's a lot of things that can go into a budget. So I have two examples of budgets here that you can see. The personal budget example and a household monthly budget. One is a lot more complicated than the other one, um, but we don't have to look at this one. So this one, we're not gonna have to look at it now because it's too complicated, but eventually you might have something that looks like that. This is what we're going to look at, your personal budget. And excuse my terrible circle, <laughs> and that did not go the way I wanted it. But this is normally where I see students at. So let's just get straight into it. Just realize you guys are not able to see my face. This is hilarious when I get stuck on the screen. <laughs> but there are four different kinds of expenses that exist. And I promise that we all have the same kind of expenses. This is across the board, across all cultures. This is what exists. 
So an expense is essentially any money that goes out. Anything that goes out is an expense. And I'm not just talking about in a business sense. This is anything that you spend money on. This is your groceries, savings. It's things that you want. It's that random pair of shoes that you bought. It's the Netflix subscription. All of that is an expense. But they are not the same. And you should not treat all expenses the same. Because some expenses are really important that you spend money on. And some of them are less so. The first expense that we have here is called a fixed expense. So these are all your all important ones. Fixed expenses are those expenses that you have to pay for in order to have an okay life, in order to be comfortable. And these are the ones that you're always going to have, and they tend to have a fixed amount every time. So here we are thinking of things like your rent or your mortgage. We're thinking of car repayments or personal loans. We're thinking of things like your internet. Usually our internet costs the same every month or every fortnight. We're talking about phone bills, electricity, water. Those are the kind of things that are fixed expenses. Making sense so far? Yep. I know it's hard when we're online, we can't interact as much, but fixed expenses, we always have them. We always have to pay for them. If we don't pay for our fixed expenses, then we're in trouble. Then we start getting stressed. The second type of expense that exists are variable expenses. And these will tell the ones where you have a little bit more flexibility with. So after all your fixed expenses have been covered, after you've put money aside for all of that, then we look at your variable expenses. These are things that you can change. So they might not always have the same fixed amount. So they might go up a little bit. They might go down a little bit. These are things that are like nice to have. But if we don't have them, then it's okay. These are things that we can be flexible with. So these can be things like going out with friends, the amount of fast food that you eat, the kind of entertainment that you pay for. This could be things like birthday presents, charity donations. So things that change a little bit. Traditionally, when people look at expenses, they looked at fixed, like they have the same number and variable, they change. So sometimes people put things like their electricity bill as a variable expense because it can go up or down. However, this belongs in the fixed expense part of your budget because you're always going to have an electricity bill, unless it's already included in your rent, of course. Just for an example. So you have to make sure that you have money for those kind of bills, even though they may be a little variable. And then we have this beautiful thing called a money leak. And I'm being, ooh, I'm being very sarcastic when I say beautiful thing because we all have money leaks. These are the things that we normally buy, but we don't account for. These are the little things that start eating into our budget. These are the things that we suddenly go, oh, why am I suddenly a bit short? I thought I had $100 for my groceries, but I only have 70. What's going on here? I'm going to give you an example of what a money leak could look like. So I one day when I was still dating my now husband, so we were a bit younger, we were dating and I was like, we need to do a budget. And, you know, he looked at me, his eyes glazed over and he's like, no, we don't. I was like, oh, but we do. Um, we're planning on moving together. Like, you know, we, we had stuff we wanted to do. So I was like, okay, we're doing a budget. He sat down with me. We did a budget. A couple of months later, he's like, hey, I seem to always be short on my budget. I'm like, what do you mean? We went through everything. He's like, I just, I just seem to always be about $50 short. I'm like, Okay, that's a significant amount. What's happening there? Where do you think your money's going? And some of you may be trying to guess, and you're welcome to put in the chat what your, what your guess might be in terms of what his money leak might be. But he's sitting there trying to figure out, right? I kind of had an inkling. And at some point, I was like, so babe, how many coffees have you had this week? And it's like a light bulb went up in his head. He just realized that, Every day that he was going to work, he was buying a coffee. Now, his coffee was about $5, give or take, $5 every day. So then we have $5 coffee every day, 10 days a fortnight. There was his $50. And it wasn't until I asked him that question that the light bulb went off. He went, that's one of my money leaks. I normally buy this, but I don't actually account for it. So I said to him, well, why don't you just put it as a fixed expense? 
He looked at me like, but I thought that was only for like rent or things like that. I'm like, in theory, yes, but you're still going to buy that coffee every day. It's part of your habit. It's part of your spending habit. So why don't you just account for it? This is what I mean about your budget should be liberating. If you're going to buy that cup of coffee, then you buy that cup of coffee. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you to account for it. So this is where this next slide comes in, in terms of, is it really that different? Like, what is the difference really that clear between fixed expenses being fixed and variable always being variable? And not totally clear, because some fixed expenses can be a little bit variable. For example, groceries, right? You're always going to need groceries, but some of you are probably sitting there going, I'm not going to buy groceries because I don't cook. I just tend to throw them out at the end of the week. So then I go, well, what do you do then for food? Do you go out? Is there a place that you get takeaway from? Do you do things like you foods? Whatever it is that you do, account for it. So if that's your main way of eating, account for it. Now, definitely there's ways that you can save a whole bunch of money with food, and I'll get to that if we have time. But the thing is, if you're going to be spending money on it regularly, then that's a money leak if you're not accounting for it. Some of your variable expenses can also be a little bit fixed. So let's say the coffee, right? And that to him couldn't go in the variable pile because he was always going to spend money on it. But his haircut, right? He regularly would get a haircut because he wanted to look nice. He wanted to have trimmed hair. That ended up being a variable that was fixed because if he overspent one month and didn't have the extra $30 or whatever it might have been, he just cut his own hair. He's gotten better at cutting his own hair, by the way. So the difference is not always that clear, but with certain things it is. So any quick questions before I move on to actually building a budget? Anything that didn't make sense, please feel free to put it in the chat or put it in the q and I'll give it a second in case anyone is typing. Um, but now, while you're all thinking if you have a question about the different kinds of expenses, now is the time where I want you to open up an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document or piece of paper of some sort. Uh, normally, I would be providing everyone with a budget, um, a pre-made budget, but I've gotten feedback that um, it's too simple and sometimes people need to change things and the formulas get stuck. So we can just create it from scratch. Also, there's like a thousand and one templates online. So you just have to find one that you like. All right, no questions. So we'll get straight into a building a budget. The very first thing that you want to do is write down your income and put this at the very top of your budget. Uh, just as I've said that, our questions come in. Ah, we cannot use the chat because it seems to be banned. Ah, interesting. Let me see if it allows me. All right, I don't know what's happening with the chat, probably because it's a webinar. So anyways, any questions that you have, <laughs> put them in the Q&A. Q&A side of it, and I will um, get to them. I don't know why the chat is not allowing me to. Um... Oh, here we go. There, fixed. Thank you for that. You should be able to type in the chat now. Um, and if it's still not working, then there's a reason why I don't work in IT. <laughs> um, all right, so got inside track again. So the first thing you want to do is write down your income. I get paid fortnightly, so my income comes in fortnightly. It's up to you. How Ever you choose to do your budget, it needs to be consistent. So if you're putting your income in fortnightly, then everything else will be fortnight. If you're putting it monthly, then everything is monthly. If you're putting it weekly, then everything is weekly. If you don't know what your income should be, because you are living off your savings, because you've stashed away a pile of money and you're going to use that, then you're going to work backwards to figure out how much you should be paying yourself. But for now, put your income at the top. And I have just spent like three minutes telling you to put your income because you will be surprised by the amount of times that I tell people to put their income in their budget and they don't. Your income is any money that you are almost guaranteed to come in. So if you work irregular shifts, if you work casual work, then put in what you believe is going to be usually your income. So for me, when I was at uni, I had two jobs. I had 
my casual tutoring job and my guaranteed one shift at Nando's. So that was my base income and that's what I based my what I based my budget on because I knew that money was coming in. So we work off worst case scenarios. Yeah, like I said, if you're living off savings until you find a part-time job, then you're going to work backwards. And I will reference some um, apps for budgeting records at the very end. So I will leave that question unanswered for now. Um, and then we'll come back to it at the end of it. All right. So we've got our we've got our income, whatever that might be. I'm going to use a hundred dollars because it's a nice easy number for me to remember. All right. So then I go. All right. I've got my income now. If you go to part two, which is write down your fixed expenses, I want you. I'm gonna like just do a terrible budget here. <laughs> All right. So you have whatever you use in your Excel spreadsheet, whatever that might be, right? So you have income. $100, right? Then we're going to go and you are going to write your fixed expenses, right? I'm going to call it Effie. Fixed expense. And the colors are just so that it's easier for you to see. And I want you to take a moment to write down, put in the chat, so you can put it here, which should be working now for everyone, all the different types of fixed expenses that you think you have. So we're looking at rent. We're looking at, say, your go card, so your bus. That should be in your fixed expense. You can actually work out how much it's going to cost you to go from home to uni. How many times you're going to do this a week, a fortnight, a month, whatever it might be, figure out how much that's going to be and account for that in your budget. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then I will continue. Now, feel free to use the chat for any other ideas. So remember, we're just writing our fixed expenses, and please put in a subheading that says fixed expenses. So we're looking at rent, we're looking at car costs, we're looking at education costs. So when I'm saying education costs, I'm not talking about the cost of your tuition, because if you're an international student, that money should already exist. You're not going to find a job here in Brisbane that's going to pay you enough to pay for that. But when I'm saying education costs, I'm thinking of things like do you need to do any printing? Do you need to do any laminating? I know that sounds old school. You may not need to. Is there access that you need to pay for for a particular program? Things like that. Your internet, how much is your internet going to cost? If you're not sure because you haven't figured everything out yet, that's okay. You can just put in internet. And then here you're writing the dollar amount. Remember that whatever you put here, if you made it fortnightly, if you made it weekly, these two also have to be done at the same frequency. All right. I will give you a minute or so to do this. If I had background music, I would play that, but I don't. And once you are sort of ready to move on to the next bit, just raise your hand through the chat so I get an idea of where people are at. A couple of people are almost ready to move on to the next bit. All right, we're almost at the double digits of people raising their hand. All right. So point three says, write down your financial goal. Now we're going to be really strategic. We're gonna leave a part of it blank here because we're gonna use that for our variable expenses. I hope you're um, enjoying my little blackboard here. And we are going to put down here, we're going to put a goal. Oh, that was hard to write. Anyways, use your imaginations, that says goal. Now, the reason why I want you to write down a financial goal at the bottom 
is because I want you to think of something that you want to aim towards in the next couple of years. For me, when I was at uni, one of my financial goals was to save enough money to buy a master three by the end of my undergrad. So I gave myself through four years, I can say three years. It was more about three and a half years where I figured out how much money do I need to save? How much money do I need to put aside to reach this financial goal? It can be something like that. It can be a short-term goal as well. It might be, hey, I want to spend um, in the summer vacation. I want to go and spend a week at the Gold Coast. And then I want to go and visit the hinterlands, whatever that might be. I want you to put down a goal. I want you to put a number of how much that might be. If you don't yet know how much that might be, just write down the goal. So your goal can be written here because it's important that we have something we're working towards. It could be as simple as my goal is to save $50 a fortnight, save $20 a fortnight. It could be as audacious to go, my financial goal is to pay off my uni debt by blah, blah, blah. It's up to you, but make sure that you're using the SMART goals analogy, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic time. I've done the really simplified version of it. Some of you may know more complex versions of SMART goal, but make sure it is something that can be done. And again, this is just a hope. I'm gonna move on to the variable expenses part because I always spend too much time on the goals and I get overly excited. So now I want you to spend time on your variable expenses here. And then we're going to put a dollar aside, okay? Fixed goals, uh, fixed expenses, you should have most of them. Variable expenses, these are your nice to have. So these might be money to buy people birthday presents. This might be money for going out. This might be money for clothing. This might be once, once a week going out for lunch. Your variable expenses go here. You may only have one or two. You may have none. Depends on how much money you had here. Right. And I'll give you about a minute and a bit for that. And then of course, once you're ready, raise your hand. And I know some of you have already started filling it out. Oh, so the chat's been quite quiet. So I'm assuming everyone, either everyone knows what their fixed and variable expenses are or nobody knows anything. <laughs> like, oh, someone else will say something. A couple of you have started to raise your hand. The next step is we're going to do two mini tallies here. Oh, some of you said we don't really know how much the cost of living in Australia is. That's totally fine because I will get to that. So if you don't have a dollar value here just yet, that's okay because we'll come to it. We will give you a pretty good idea of it. The important thing is that you know what your income is. So if you know how much money you're getting in, we can work around that. But if you don't actually know the dollar amount, that's okay, as long as you know what you need to spend money on. All right, so we have two tallies that we're going to do. First, we're gonna tally up the total of our fixed expenses. So say for my $100, after I put in all my values here, it comes to $70, right? Which means, I have $30 left over for all this other stuff. And say I've tallied this up and this comes to $50. I've made a mistake somewhere because my income, sorry, my expenses are higher than my income. So two ways to fix this, earn more, spend less. <laughs> Notice how I pointed to this part when I said spend less because these ones are the ones we're going to spend anyway. So here so far, so good. Maybe this one only comes to 20, and then I get $10 here. And then we want to add this and this and this. 
And ideally, the number that is here is zero or more. Excel has really fancy ways of doing automatic tallies, so you can get this all automated. So once you create or download a template, it will have all of this. Now, for some of you that don't know the coast in Australia, take a guess for now. Important that this bit is filled in. All right, so I've... hopefully I haven't confused anyone. Any questions about this? I know your budget's looking pretty rough right now, but I did say there's always more information that there is time. So I need to have the basics and the basics of your budget should be should be split into three things, fixed expenses, variable expenses and goals. This is going to be a working document. It is not a set and forget. Your budget grows with you as you get more income, as you get less income, as you expand your life, as you maybe, you know, expand the people in your life, your budget changes. Please don't only do it once go yep I've set my money aside I've set my bank accounts and never touch it again you are going to need to keep looking at it all right are we all ready to move on to the next slide yep all right so I'm going to clear all my drawings almost a bit sad that was such a work of art <laughs> all right so this is the next bit that you wanted to find out how much money do I need to spend in Brisbane? It's a little bit more than you'd like, but a little bit less than you think. This is the um, general, general question. So I've had someone already put in the chat what they're putting in per week. So 495, uh, 460 per week, a little bit high on the higher end of rent, but it depends on their situation. So here we go. Essentially, the cost of living in Brisbane has gone up significantly. If we were looking at the cost of living in Brisbane two years ago, don't, if you're looking at a budget from back then, because it has changed a lot. Because we are, we flooded and then COVID, and then people were like, oh, you know what? The Olympics are coming. So I'm going to migrate here because things are going to go up. It's gotten a little bit more expensive. And I don't think that's just Brisbane. I think that's all over the world. So we just need to be aware the cost of living has gotten higher. So we need to be clever with our spending. Again, very theoretical. So let's be prepared. I am looking at this through a student lens. Your rent per week will cost you between 150 to $250 if you are living in a shared house or an apartment and you're possibly even sharing a room with someone. So if you're looking at more than 150 side of things, this may be a, a shared room. So there might be two beds in one room. It might be bunk beds. Um, you may possibly have your own room. But if you're looking at between 150 to 250, definitely a shared house, definitely shared room, shared amenities. If your budget allows for a little bit more, you might be looking between 250 to 350 plus. This is going to be in a share house, probably your own room. So if you're spending 250 plus, have your own room. Don't be sharing a room with someone. You're getting a little bit ripped off. Um, and you might possibly have your own bathroom depending on the setup, or you might share a bathroom with one or two other people. Again, there is a lot of variability depending on which suburb you go to, what is included in the rent, all those sort of things. So that's roughly where we're at. If you're spending above $350, so if we're going to $350 plus, 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 then you're looking at your own place. So you might have your own studio apartment, you might have your own room, everything to yourself. Some of you may prefer to go to the preferred student providers or student accommodation, which now vary around $310 to $410, depending on what you want. You get your own apartment, so it's a studio or a little bit bigger, depending on what you're paying. Um, and you get pretty much everything included in that student accommodation. So the benefits of the student accommodation is you have one set price, which includes electricity, water, internet, most of them have some sort of gym. So it's all kind of set and forget, but it is on the higher end of things. 
some of you, depending on where you go and rent, will have all your bills included in your rent. So your $260 may include already electricity, may include internet. We're having some really good, um, like some, some really good ideas put into the chat. So some people have, are putting in how much they pay, their utilities, those sort of things. So thank you for that, because I think that's going to be so helpful. So these are going to be kind of like you're in, whoop, what's going on here? Come back. All right, gone too far. <laughs> so these are going to be sort of your initial, your initial shock. The numbers that I'm providing you here are on the very conservative side. Whatever that I've said here, add a little bit extra into this, all right? because this is the conservative estimate. You're also going to have ongoing bills. So your groceries depends on how much you eat, how much you exercise, what you eat, your body size, all of that. You're going to be spending between $80 to $150 per week. And that's just on groceries. So things that you're going to do to be using for cooking. When you're first getting set up, when you first arrive in Brisbane and you're getting your place set up, there's going to be a chunk of money that is going to be spent on setting up your kitchen. So things like getting spices, getting sauces, you know, things like chili flakes, chili sauce, all those things. So the basic stuff, getting cooking oil, there's going to be a chunk of money that's going to be a one-off. But then after that, you should be pretty much on average between 80 and 150. One of the questions I get is, I have no idea how much food costs in Australia. The way that I find is a little bit easier to remember is, think about how much food you, sorry, how much money you were spending back home in food. So maybe for a week, you were spending a hundred or whatever your currency is back home. You're going to be spending a hundred of the Australian currency. So don't try and convert it because you will be quite shocked and cry a little bit, just bring it across. So if before you were spending about $100 on groceries, it's going to be a little bit similar in Australia. That gives you a, a bit of an indication. I find most students that are non-vegetarian, that have no, no super specific dietary requirements, end up spending about $100 to $120 a week on food. Then you want to kind of consider, are you a coffee drinker? Do you normally go out and drink coffee? Do you normally go out and get takeaways? If you are a takeaway getter, spend less money on groceries and do a little bit more budget for takeaway. Um, although it's not the healthiest, if that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. Now, transport, I actually think someone in the chat has figured out that the, the transport in their go-kart as $50 per week, which Sounds roughly correct. Remember that if you're a full-time student, you will get access to concession rates. So it'll be a little bit cheaper. Um, the transport, it gives you a little bit of an idea. You're about five to 10 trips. So you're spending about 20 to $30. Make sure that you register your go-kart online, you set that up and you have it ready to go. Fuel depends again on the distance. It depends on the parking we are looking at about 60 to 120 dollars and i would say that's probably a fortnight rather than a week unless you are driving extremely long distances and your car is not very good if you are going to be driving to uni you need to get here early and i don't mean student early i mean people in the workplace early so you're here by 7 30 8 a.m so that you can get the cheap parking around the ring road Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in the expensive parking of paying per hour. So if you want to get that $7 parking, you get here early. Now, phone plans. I've seen a couple of people have their phone plans as $40 per month, um, $20 per month, those kind of things. Um, you don't need as much internet as you think you do. I'll give you, I'll use myself as an example because it's it's easier because I know my spending habits. When I am at home, I am connected to the Wi-Fi at home. When I'm at work, I'm connected to the Wi-Fi at work. So I really only need internet when I'm out and about. If I am, you know, using Google Maps or if I'm going to enjoy life outside. 
but the bulk of my time, I'm connected to some sort of Wi-Fi. So I actually don't need a phone plan that has 60 gigabytes of internet because it's unnecessary. So for all of you out there, be really, really conscious about how much you actually need on your phone. Have a look at things like, do you need international calls to particular countries? Do you need, how much do you actually need in terms of internet? Be aware of really expensive phone plans with lots of things that you don't need. So you, I promise that you don't need the latest phone that's come out. The one below is fine because a lot of them will get you in for two years and you'll end up spending a lot. Myself, I spend $15 a month on my phone plan. It's more than enough. I get unlimited phone calls, six gigabytes of internet, unlimited text messages. And I've never needed more than that. So have a think for you. There's some really good carriers out there that are great with international students. Amazim is one of them. Um, oh, Lara? not how you pronounce it, it's another one of them, Moose Mobile, Aldi. So have a, have a look at all of them because some of your first providers, so like things like Optus and Telstra, Vodafone, are quite expensive and don't necessarily provide you anything better than the other carriers like Aldi, even like Woolworths. Have a look at what you need. If what you need is phone calls to a particular country, there are actually companies that that's what they what what they really are the what <laughs> sorry what they specify in like that is their specialty um electricity is going to cost you anywhere between thirty dollars to a hundred dollars a month and that's going to depend on whether everything's electric in your house so you have hot electric hot water and electric cook stove all of those things again it may already be included in your rent just make sure that you read your rental agreement Water can be anywhere from $10 to $60 a month. Um, a lot of rentals don't actually have water bills because they're not individually metered. But again, have a look at that. Also, it depends on how many people are in your house. That's approximately what we're seeing. Now, gas is a quarter. So every three months, we're looking between $40 to $200. Um, again, it depends on what you have in your house. So some apartments don't have gas bills at all. They just have electricity bills. So this should give you a little bit of a better estimate of how much things cost. Um, yes, I will write down some of these phone plans at the end. Um, just remind me, just remind me. I will put in the names of some of those companies. Um, and some of you may also have really good tips. I find students know more, a lot of more stuff in terms of um, things that give you student discounts. That's another thing. Make sure that you ask for student discounts with anything that you sign up for. Now, here are some really good comparison websites. So before you sign up with anything, these websites here, um, pretty much you can plug in, okay, I wanna look at electricity, I wanna look at phone plans. Um, you can compare through any of these websites. Uh, I find that in general, these websites are quite good. There will be someone that will call you to say, oh, hey, look, I know you were looking at electricity plans. Let's have a chat. Uh, you can find a really good deal on them, although the person will make a commission out of what you select. You don't pay for their commission. That is paid by the company that you select. In general, though, you will still get a good deal. So some of the better ones that I find are CanStar and Choice. These two are quite good in terms of helping you find general information. All right, I'm going to keep going. Um, so now we're getting into the variable part of your budget. As you can see before, we started focusing on the ex uh, fixed expenses. And now we're going to the variable part. And you need to have some fun money, some spending money, because you didn't just come to Brisbane to study and do nothing else. Enjoy your time at university. Make sure that you set a little bit of money aside to enjoy things. Um, a good question is, do we have to pay for cycle parking? Uh, if it's a motorcycle, yes. And I think it's between five to seven dollars a day. If we're looking at a bicycle, then no. But you do need to register for a bike locker. And you can do this through um, the properties and facilities website, or you can pop it to Prentice Building and they will tell you how that works. Uh, but no, you don't have to pay for bicycles. All right. 
I'm gonna mark that as done. All right. So please don't come here and just study and don't do anything. Enjoy life. So you, if you want to go to the movies um, and you have you go on Tuesday where it's cheap student night, you might only be paying six dollars. But if you want to splurge and go to gold class, you might be looking at twenty dollars. Nightclubs. Some of you are still young and want to enjoy being out and about. If you get there after usually 10 p.m., you get charged an entry fee. It is not worth paying $20 to get into a club because you might get in there and go, this is not very good. I want to leave. So my hot tip here is get there early, go into the club and get your stamp. So that stamp means that you've gone in. Then leave, go and have your dinner and then come back, show them the stamp and you don't have to pay cover charge. One thing that we love to do in Australia is this thing called BYO. I'm going to write that for you. B Y. Oh, that's terrible. Y. Oh, bring your own. Uh, it can be a little bit of a cultural clash with some people when someone invites you over to the house and says, uh, BYO food or BYO alcohol. Or they might say, bring a plate. Anything that has those connotations means please bring something to share. So if they say bring a plate, this actually means that it's going to be, if you think about it, like a potluck kind of gathering where everyone's going to bring something to share. If it says BYO, it literally means bring your own food that you don't have to share or bring your own alcohol that you don't have to share. And when I moved to Australia, um, I went, I was a child and I went to a party that said um, bring a plate. And we didn't know what that meant. So my mom just assumed that the host didn't have enough cutlery and utensils and plates for everyone. So I showed up at a party with a plate, a fork, and a knife. That's not what they meant. They meant bring something to share. Luckily, the host um, was very kind and could see the funny side of it. But actually, this is a really good way of saving money and trying different kinds of food. So if you're going to get together with your friends, why not do a bring a, bring a plate of food? All right, we're going good for time. Um, next, oh, actually, let me just uh, clear all my drawings. <laughs> uh, any questions with this part of part of things? Uh, great. So more really good information in the chat. All right. Now this is also very important. If you've tuned out, please tune back in. If you're just getting a bit tired. This is the second really, really important part of this presentation. Um, this is how to organize your bank account so that you are never stressed about where your money's going again. And we do it in three, three bank accounts. Any less than that, things are gonna get confused. Any more than that, things are going to get confused. And this is just while you're a student. As you get older and your life becomes more enriched with things, you might have more accounts. But essentially, you want three accounts. Pick whatever bank you like that does not charge you any fees. If you are with a bank right now that is charging you a fee, leave, go somewhere else. If they're charging you a fee, tell them that you're a student, they should remove all the fees. But do not put your money in an account that charges you anything. Because banks make money out of your money, so you don't need to pay them for anything. All right. So three accounts. The first account is your everyday or pay account. This is where all your income goes in. If you're leaving off savings, you're going to pay everything into that. So you're going to use that savings account as an account that's going to pay you money. So if you're doing that, we're still doing it this way. So you have a pay account. All your income goes in here. Any money that you're earning goes into this one. This one will have a card attached to it, a debit card that you can use. So that's where all the money that goes in and what you're going to spend goes in there. Then you have a second account or a bills account. Also a do not touch me unless it's a bill account. That's what I like. That's what I had it named as uni. Um, do not touch me unless it's a bill account because it would make me laugh, but also it would stop me from touching it. Now, because we are all clever and savvy, we're going to figure out how to do automatic transfers and direct debits. So your money goes into your pay account when you get paid. Bam, your nice hundred dollars. And then you have figured out through your fixed expenses that you need to transfer a total of $70 to your bills account. So you set up an automatic transfer from your pay account 
the same day or the day after your pay comes in, bang, hits your bills account. Normally with this bills account, I do not recommend that you have a card attached to it because you don't want to accidentally be going out one day and having a great time and just going, oh, I'll just borrow a little money from myself. I'll pay myself back because you won't, because your brain lied to you, because it'll forget. So you don't touch this unless it's for your bills. So bang, your $70 goes in here, and then you've set up either direct debits or automatic payments. So your $30 of rent goes out automatically. Your um, phone bill that gets paid once a month, you've set up a direct debit account, so they take it out every month. It's all done automatically. Now, you may choose to leave your grocery money into your pay account. And that's what I do. My grocery money stays in my pay account because I'm actively paying for that every week. Because it goes up or down a little bit, you know, out of my $100, say $20 for the sake of this exercise, sometimes it's 19, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 15. So I use that pay account, but I never go over it because I do click and collect. I buy my groceries online um, because it's easier for me. But your bills account, you should never not have enough money for your fixed expenses because you've accounted for. And then you have a third account, which is your savings account or your goal account. It could be two in one. Again, money goes into your pay account. The $70 went into your bills. The $10 went into your savings account. And there's only $20 left in that pay account. So that's your variable money. That was your going out money. That was your gift money. That's your do whatever you want with that money. It's your money for whatever variable expenses you want. Sometimes you might have more in that pay account and sometimes you might end up with zero. But the thing is, you never wanna go into a minus because then the banks will charge you for not having money in there. I know it's a little bit counter productive, counterintuitive that you don't have money, so I'm going to charge you more money. But don't pay late fees. Don't pay overdraft fees. They're not worth it. So three accounts. Money goes in, automatic payments go out to your bills account, to your savings account, and then you have whatever's left in there. I recommend to check your transactions frequently. Um, be aware scammers are getting excellent at their scamming. So they'll do it by SMS, they'll do it by email, they'll send you an email that looks almost just like your bank, just saying, just click here to confirm that this transaction happened. Your bank was not going to send you to a link like that. If you're not sure, call them or go separately. All right, now there's a couple of questions. Okay, one question is, which bank in Brisbane should we pick as students? Anyone that you like that does not charge you a fee. I know that's very generic. I, there's so many banks, whichever one you're comfortable with. Some people go with CBA because it's on campus, as long as it's not charging you anything. Um, as a student, you want, to, you want to make sure that you're not spending money that you don't need to spend. Now, your savings account should have, should be a high interest savings account. So there should be some kind of interest that's being generated on it. Have a look around in some of those websites. So compare the market, canstar, choice.com.au. You can actually compare savings account. Which one has the highest interest saving? How does it work? Make sure that you read how it actually works because some of them say, you know, your base interest will be 0.1% and your bonus interest will be um, 2.9%. So you go, oh, cool, it's 3% per annum. But you might find that to get the bonus, you need to put in a certain amount of money. Some of them are very generous and they literally say, you must just have an everyday account with us and then you get the bonus. So just have a read through it. You're all incredibly intelligent people. You've managed to make your way all the way here. You've got into UQ. This should be not super complicated. But again, three accounts, pay, bills and savings. Any questions about that? Okay, really good question. Do we need a tax file number to open a bank account? No, you don't need a tax file number to open a bank account, but I do recommend getting a tax file number if you're gonna have an account that accrues interest. Tax file numbers are free to get, so please do not go with an agency that's going to charge you to get a tax file number. To get a tax file number, so a TFN, this is what you Google, ATO, TFN. 
it should take you to without the um, typo, it should take you to the Australian Taxation Office, where you apply online. Before you get your tax file number, make sure that you know where you're going to live because it takes about two to three weeks for it to arrive and they send it by post. So if you're still, like if you're in temporary accommodation right now, just wait until you actually know where you're going to live or um, provide a, an address of someone who is staying somewhere that you trust. Now with banks, you don't actually need one that um, has physical branches because almost everything will be done online. But because you are an international student, they might actually ask you to come in person to verify your ID. The website for the tax file number is the Australian Taxation Office. If you want to open a savings account with a high interest, yes, you should get a tax file number. Um, and that will be for the purpose of claiming your tax later on. You don't need to have a TFN to have a high interest savings account, but it is recommended. TFN is tax file number. All right. I'm going to talk even faster because I'm looking at the time and I know we don't have too much time left. Money saving tips. Figure out when your local supermarket puts down product produce. So when is our specials? If you shop at Aldi, Aldi has random specials on Wednesdays and Saturdays. I find that my local calls usually on a Friday and Saturday, they don't have too many specials, but on a Sunday they do. And because I like to do a click and collect, so I shop online, I also find that sometimes they even just give you a discount for shopping online. You can check catalogs or when the deals are. Um, sometimes you can do when they're doing half price. So if I want to buy, you know, like my anti-wrinkle cream or a particular kind of soap that I like, and it's half, like 50% off, I'll buy two. That way I have one for later. Um, look at the per 100 gram price when available. So you, when you're looking at comparing things, we, we used to think bigger is always cheaper, but not necessarily. Compare how much it costs per 100 grams, because then you're going to find out which one's better value for money. And you don't need the most, the specific brand of something. Like the food regulations in Australia are very, very high. So almost all of the food you'll find is almost at the same quality. Um, of course, there'll be things that you'll go, no, but I like the specific taste of that specific brand. So go for that, but just compare it. Um, meal prep or cook in bulk. This was my thing that I did at uni. I would, I became very good at like one pot wonders. So I was very good at cooking like a big thing of pasta. Um, so we'll do like a chicken pasta or a bolognese pasta, I'd put in a couple of containers. I'd keep it in the freezer. So I would have like my own little takeaway. Um, depends on what you like to cook. You know, you might do a big batch of curry. If you have a couple of friends that you get along with quite well, you might decide, hey, let's do like a food swap. I'll cook a big batch of whatever you're good at cooking. Someone might offer something and you can just swap containers around. It's a really nice way to get to know new flavors, but also it saves money. Hard rubbish days are essentially, there is this thing that happens. It's going to happen it starts usually from August where we call it curbside collection. I'm going to type it in because it's quite a mouthful to say. You can Google that. This is essentially when the council goes, hey, we all know you got big stuff in your house that you want to throw out, um, but it doesn't fit in your bin. Put it outside on the curb and we'll come and collect it. Um, People do this and they sometimes throw out really good stuff like couches and things like that. So that's a good way to set up. Uh, yes, would you like to let us know Facebook groups or online communities where UQ students and fresh graduates offer giveaways or sell their secondhand stuff? Absolutely. There are lots of Facebook groups. There is a, there's a group called UQ Stalker Space, which is not actually a UQ space, but students have created it. Um, if you find that one in there, it'll have links to Facebook groups that um, that students who have graduated give away. Usually it's a lot of textbooks, your own community, like depending on what you're studying, there will be a Facebook group for it. I don't know a specific one, but trust me, it exists. You can just search by your course code, 
something will come up. Also, Facebook Marketplace has so many things, so many things there. I'm constantly surprised. Now, this is, if you can take a photo of this page, I don't want to go through every single one of them because I am conscious of time. Um, but Facebook Marketplace have found to be a really good source of finding cheap furniture, even textbooks, um, clothing, things like that. The Rockley Markets, this one's here, very good for, part of my terrible um, highlight, but they're very good for fresh produce. So if you're good at cooking, it's quite good there. Bring cash because you don't want to pay the $2.50 ATM fee. Coco's in Annerley. So again, oh gosh. Anyways, that one, <laughs> it's quite good at finding specific food. Now, I have also found that your specialty shops like Indian shops, um, some of your um, general Asian grocery stores, they're very good for cheap spices. So what might cost you $3 at Coles or Woolworths, double the size of the bag will cost you $1.50. So get creative. All right. Money wasters. Things that you might be wasting your money on. Coffee. My um, lovely husband, who was $50 out of pocket continuously, we just ended up buying a coffee machine. He's now never out of pocket. We worked out that the coffee machine has now paid for itself about four times over. If you're with a gym and you're not using it, cancel it, transfer it to someone else. This is what um, I saw someone in my local Facebook page saying, hey, I want to join this gym. Anyone want to transfer their uh, gym membership over? And it worked out really well for both of them. The other person just um, covered the transfer fee. They got a better rate in the end. You don't need all the luxury items because you're paying someone to just use their brand. Doesn't necessarily work better. Staying at an expensive phone plan. We're getting your water bottle and spending $4 every time you need a coffee, uh, any, anytime you need a drink. Okay, this is a great question. I, I'm getting sidetracked. Any tips for cheaper wines and craft beers? Because usually it's an expensive item. Yes, alcohol is extremely expensive in Australia. And if you're drinking out, it's even more expensive than you think it should be. Most alcohol shops will price match. So if your local bottle O, that's what we call it here, has something that you like and you see it for special at another bottle shop, just ask them to price match it. Cheaper wines, um, they come out of a cardboard box. They're called Goon. If you're young, it might not give you a headache. If you're past 23, 24, it will definitely give you a headache. Craft beers, ask for the beer on tap. There's lots of different breweries around. They will be your cheaper ones. Um, but yeah, the it is an expensive item with alcohol. What you pay for is what you get. The cheaper it is, the nastier it is, the worse the headache will be. Um, but I don't think I'm telling you anything that you don't necessarily already know. All right. So I had a question before in terms of apps. I would start with going to this website called moneysmart.gov.au. It is excellent. It has some really good tips. It's got a budget builder in there. It has some really great tools there. It will allow you to figure out different kinds of expenses. It will give you examples. It's a really good place to get started. There is so many of Microsoft Office templates where it comes to budgeting. Just pick one that you like. Um, most banks, depending on which one you go with, but most of them have an app that might allow you to see where your expenses are going. You can also download budgeting apps. Please listen to this. If you're downloading an app and it is asking you for your bank details, you are going to get scammed. Do not provide your bank details. If the app is one that asks you to manually input your expenses, good. The very first thing you need to do is if you don't know how to start your budget, then you need to figure out what you spend your money on. So I recommend that you do this for the next three weeks, that you start tracking all of your expenses manually. I know manually, but this is why. Week one, so you'll live here all energized, ready to budget. Week one, you'll be very conscious of your spending. You'll be aware of where it's going. You'll make better decisions. 
week two, you'll get sick of being so conscious. You'll fall back into your normal habits. You'll start to see your pattern. Week three, you will change some of your behaviors and start to adapt to your new budget. That's why I say you do it for three weeks. Track them. Apple Store or Google Play has lots of really good budgeting apps. There's not one specific one that I can give you because they're constantly being upgraded and there's new ones that come. All right, if you find yourself in extreme financial hardship, we have a financial assistance program. This is for unforeseen and unexpected emergencies. You can come and chat to us at Student Central. You can make an appointment with a student advisor to discuss your financial situation. If you're spending money on smoking, please contact Weightline. Smoking in Australia is extremely expensive. There's no smoking on campus anywhere on campus. Smoking in general, you'll find in Australia is not very common. So now is a really good time to quit. And I don't know if I mentioned that the moneysmart.gov.au website is really good. All right, this is information overload for all of you. I am now just going to focus on your questions. If you have questions, there's the Q&A or the chat. All right, so phone plans. I am going to write them down. Amazing. It's amazing. There's Aldi, there's Moose, there's Lyra who has changed their name as a starting point. All right. Facebook groups, I think I've answered that one. Bicycle looking at university. Yes, I can answer that. So All right, I've put in the answer there. I've answered the craft beer, great question. All right, any other questions, any other comments? Ah, I put it, okay. I am going back to this chat. So we have amazing. <laughs> we have okay, okay. Another questions come in. Oh, so you attended the working on a student visa. Okay. Do you know what time that was meant to be? I will pass. I, I don't know. I didn't run that one, but I will certainly find out for you. Actually, I don't know if I spelled amazing right. Um, yes, I've just done that. You see above? Any other questions? Any other slides you wanted me to go back to? Anyone stuck with their budget? Anyone not still not sure what to do? If you are really stuck, if you need a bit of help, my name is Diana Earl. You can send me an email. You're welcome to send me an email through there, or you can always book in an appointment with any of our advisors and we can help you a little bit with this. Obviously, we're not necessarily um, experts in this. Okay, so... Um, so in terms of your COE and that, you're going to need to contact, it's not through me, you should be contacting the delay in receiving the link. Let me see. You need to contact the student center or um, new students. So can you send that email to student central, please? 
Um, unfortunately, I'm unable to answer this question. It's outside my line of scope. All righty, anyone else, any other questions? Um, I'm wondering where I have. Okay, some really good questions about when to start work. It can take up to six months to find a job. It depends on how busy your degree is. Some degrees are extremely busy and you won't have time to do a part-time job. Um, some degrees are a little bit more, more relaxed. As a starting point, usually a casual job over the weekend, most students can handle that. Um, if your degree includes placement, it gets a little bit harder because of the amount of time you have. Depends on what you're studying. Um, part-time jobs for students at the Gatton campus. Ooh. Are you staying at Gannon? If you are staying at Gannon, I recommend getting in touch with our advisor there, with Katrina. Um, yes, you can apply for part-time jobs at San Lucia. So usually the union will have jobs there. Um, it just depends on whether there's something available. But yes, as long as you can work, then you're allowed to apply. If you're planning on working, you need a tax file number. So make sure that you apply for your tax file number before you start work. You don't necessarily need to have received it, but you do need to have at least applied for it. Hopefully that answers your question. No, no one's kicking me out of this room yet. So I have time for a couple more questions. Do you not, okay, you don't see the plans. I'm gonna put them again in the chat, phone plans. There you go. Is there a website to check for availability? I'm guessing, okay, this is a question about availability of work. I'm gonna put it in the main chat. So we wanna look at Career Hub. We wanna look at SIG. And we're looking at things like store, attendance, waiter. I've put a couple of suggestions up there. Um, let me know if that answers your question. Right. Any other questions that we can think of? No, no more questions. I, I always say no more questions and then someone might be typing something. So I'll give it a minute. I think that's it. I don't think there's any other questions. Well, thank you all very much for joining me. If you have any other questions, I've put my email somewhere in the chat. My name was Diana. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, one more. That uh, was just a thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Bye.